We are okay with the streaming connection? Okay, so welcome once again. Um, it's been a hectic first week of COP. We're very, very thankful for your presence here today. Um, this is our side event titled Putting People and Real Solutions at the Heart of Climate Action. My name is Josefina Villegas. I am a membership and policy coordinator for the civil society platform for development effectiveness, and I will be moderating this panel discussion today. In the context of the global stock take process of the Paris Agreement, we are gathered today to share and uplift grassroots per grassroot perspectives on people-centered real solutions for climate action. Today we will be sharing on inputs from a diverse group of civil society organizations from the Global South, uh, on perspectives on feminist critique and alternatives to false solutions, right-based climate action for land rights and food sovereignty, proposals for enhancing climate finance effectiveness, and the role of the global stock tech process in ensuring the centrality of locally led climate solutions and civil society participation. I would like to give the word now to Ivan Enrile, our climate justice program manager. Jax will be speaking? Okay. I don't understand, sorry. <laughs> So I had wrong notes for this. Okay, so apparently we will be opening up with a video by Dinda Yura from Solidaritas Perempuan from Indonesia. Okay. Right now many people are in the fighting to combat climate crisis. Without their meaningful participations, the world leader will just keep producing the false solutions. The big forums like G20 or COP keep talking big about energy transitions. But in the practices in Indonesia, it's actually just about the investment, about how to raise funds for the big scale energy projects that destroy the people's livelihood and their culture and also their spiritual value. We also have a lot of experiences regarding the forest projects, like the REDD, REDD uh, that basically cutting the access of people to their livelihood in the forest. Meanwhile, it cannot stop the deforestation and also the forest fires. It is, of course, not a s climate solution when it's causing the same problem, which is the loss of the people's livelihood. The climate solution has to be community-oriented when women has to be in the heart of the decisions and solutions. No climate projects without women's approval. So now I think I'm correct to say that Evan Enrile, Climate Justice Program Manager for Yvonne International, will be giving our opening statement for our event today. Yes, thank you, Joe. My name is Ivan Enrile. I'm from the Philippines. I'm the Climate Justice Program Manager of our organization. And good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to our side event, uh, Putting People and Real Solutions at the Heart of Climate Action. Um, I would like to also thank our collaborators, the CSO Partnership for Development uh, Effectiveness, uh, Gender CC, Galinavo, Life EV, Secodicon and Enda Energy. So in a few minutes, civil society and climate justice movements at the COP27 will be marching for the Global Day of Action for Climate Justice. Um, unlike in previous COPs, unfortunately, the march will be taking place within this convention center only. 
The march will take place precisely to highlight that civil society is continuously being pushed to the margins and our voices stifled. And precisely why we find ourselves in the current predicament is because we continue to ignore the fact that people's democratic participation and human rights should be central to achieving climate justice. Grassroots voices have been marginalized in so many ways, from deprivation of access and resources to support and scale up community-led climate action and practices that contribute to climate action while enhancing people's rights um, from exclusion from climate policy making and governance to outright repression and killing of their environmental land and human rights defenders. Meanwhile, polluting companies continue to shape and define COP agenda, allowing them to plunder our lands, water, forests, and pollute the air we breathe. In this COP alone, 600 fossil fuel lobbyists are attending roundtable discussions, workshops, and side events holding big flashy pavilions to lobby for false solutions like carbon capture technologies and offset projects using our forests, oceans, and other natural wealth and resources, and peddle net zero promises. Meanwhile, civil society like us are kicked out of negotiation rooms. We are holding this side event in the spirit of solidarity with the People's Marches happening right here inside this convention center, but also in other places of the world. The discussions that we will be having is our contribution to the need to counter big polluters' narrative and lift frontline communities facing repression and violence. Today, we will hear the stories of struggles of the communities and peoples that are seldom given space and heard at COP. We will learn about their stories of forging innovative practices and solutions to enhance collective resilience and strength to protect ecological balance and integrity in the face of climate change, and how these in initiatives are inextricably linked with their broader struggle for people's rights and sovereignty, gender justice, land rights, indigenous people's self-determination, and liberation. The stories that we will be hearing today are part of the stories of our comrades marching outside, challenging the dominant, the, the, the dominant fossil fuel-dependent, elitist, racist, patriarchal and imperialist defend, uh, development model. And today, we choose to amplify these voices. So thank you very much, and we look forward to your participation in this very important discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivan. So without further ado, I would just like um, to mention that our proposal today in line with what Ivan was upholding and raising, is to center and structure the debate around what concrete actions are being taken and should be taken to ensure the integration of human rights, including indigenous people's rights, equity, gender justice, and considerations of civil society solutions in global and national climate policy for a just transition to effective climate action. We will start our panel today with an intervention from Makoma Leka Lakala and Ndil Mokwena from the Gender Constituency. Please take the floor. Thank you so much, Joseph. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ndivile Mukwena, and I am from Gender CC, Women for Climate Justice, based in South Africa. Um, it is my pleasure to be here to be able to share um, the perspective of the work that we are doing and what are our expectations as we come to this space. Um, as a, a rapidly warming world manifest heat, heat waves, floods, droughts, and hurricanes, geoengineering, a large scale manipulation of the Earth's natural systems, net zero commitments, false agricultural systems, monoculture forest solutions offsets etc. are all false solutions being presented as a strategy to counteract or combat climate change. This is business as usual and alarmingly current debates about this big techno fix 
are limited to a small group uh, of self-proclaimed experts reproducing undemocratic worldviews and uh, technocratic perspectives. While indigenous people, local communities, women and youth are excluded and left voiceless. Geoengineering technologies threatens people, people and ecosystems. Holistic assessments of um, technologies also show that if deployed, they are highly likely to worsen rather than mitigate impacts of global warming. The greenwashing of false solutions has unfortunately also been co-opted by corporations, governments to falsely rebrand highly uh, damaging practices as green, whereby promoting monoculture, a three, a, a, a three, monoculture three plantation as offsets can lead to land grabbing, displacement, loss of livelihoods, heritage, loss of heritage sites, ancestral land, disruption of cultural practices, soil erosion, fresh water depletion, biodiversity loss, and many other impacts. These types of unsustainable agricultural practices put even more pressure on the agricultural system, particularly on small-scale farmers and food producers, the majority of whom are women, and lead, this leads to food insecurity and poverty. Women in all their diversity must be recognized for their role as custodians and defenders of ecological and environmental resources and vital agents of change. A reference to nature by corporate and multilateral companies does not imply that environmental, social, and health impacts would be considered. Now, looking at the solutions um, that we expect to be addressed at this COP. We need a just and equitable transition from fossil fuels for all and total divestment from fossil fuels. Sustainable community-owned and women-led technological solutions. Indigenous and traditional knowledge to be incorporated in climate actions, policies, and frameworks, and respect for communities' rights to full, to, to full control of their ag agricultural and indigenous seed and food system, as well as traditional farmers' rights. We need to work with and promote community-driven approaches and solutions that will prioritize and reclaim their environmental and social rights. Developed countries need to commit um, immediately to halt all new investment in fossil fuels and nuclear energy with a clear and urgent shift from fossil fuel-based economy to a sustainable, just, transformative, feminist economy centering gender responsive and use of renewable energies. Investment in local uh, solutions have been tested and proven to be gender just, transformative, and can be traced across continents. From green energy projects in rural areas to household and agricultural cooperatives to empowering women in rural um, areas through integrated climate resilient development. These solutions and many others, which continue to be documented by women and gender constituency, are testimony to invaluable leadership women in all their diversity in the fight against climate change. So investing in the, your leadership and solutions is not just a right and just thing to do, but also it is a mitigation strategy. We need renewable, safe and clean energy projects that reduce burden of unpaid work, which women and girls spend up to 75% of their time engaged in. Gender transformative renewable and clean energy programs prove to, be, to have multiple health and livelihood co-benefits. So community-led, gender-just um, um, uh, approaches need to be at the core of the decisions of climate actions. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much.
Please go ahead. I can just continue. Uh, my name is Mako Malikalakala, and I'm from EarthLife Africa Johannesburg, which is an activist um, environmental justice organization. Women have been at the forefront of decarbonization for quite a long time, and this has not been recognized. They also have put their lives on the line for protecting the environment. And this it's evident and we see it every time whenever there's dirty energy projects that are being proposed in different areas. In South Africa, we have a proposal of an energy metallurgical um, a special economic zone plant and this is at the backdrop of South Africa having made its commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the backdrop of South Africa having presented its national determined contributions to the Paris Agreement and also in the background that South Africa had just come up with a just transition framework which was developed by multi or different stakeholders in the country. And this energy metallurgical plant in the area, and it's called Musina Makado Special Economic Zone. It would increase South Africa's carbon footprint in 16% uh, 16 of South, South Africa's carbon, when South Africa has actually made formal intentions and committed itself to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The other project that is of concern, that is worrying, is in Uganda, and that is the East African Crude Oil Pipeline, which both this, um, this, this project are actually increasing the carbon footprint and also are displacing people and uh, they are going to destroy the biodiversity of, um, of, of, of the, the very countries they are in and where this project are identified to take place. This is, these are the areas with the richest biodiversity in both countries. And um, one of the things is that these are false solutions. They are brought in as a form of development, but that development is also going not to benefit the very people who live in those particular areas. One of the mitigating factors that is being advanced when these projects are being put across is that there is going to be a mitigation strategy and that mitigating strategy is always put as that carbon capture storage. I wonder whether this CCS has ever been of benefit because its intention is just to poison the soil that um, that people are, are, are living off from. So part of what is being presented as real solutions is actually false solutions. And those false solutions are, the false solutions also have got a human rights violation element within them. The real solutions um, are at the heart that we're saying there are real solutions is that of people protecting their livelihoods. But with this project, that it's not the case. The protection of biodiversity should be at the center of saying we're bringing real solution. But these projects are destroying the biodiversity that people rely on, that their sacred sites are in, that their cultures are in, that their heritage are embedded around the trees, around the streams and rivers, around the hills, around the plant. And this is where the solutions should lie. The other real solution that we need now is uh, that of protecting the, the climate protectors. The, we see an unprecedented um, repression, threats, and killing of, activi of activists, those who are protecting their biodiversity. So the real honor that I'm putting across is that we need to honor those that protect so that the environment, the biodiversity, it's not destroyed. The 
What is important, we talk about a just transition or a transition towards a low carbon development. And this is what women in different indigenous communities have brought up so that they can protect their environments. So when we talk about a low carbon development, it should be inclusive and also involve those that have been at the forefront of protecting their biodiversity for as long as we can remember, and those are women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Makoma and Deville. I will now give the floor to Ajay Jha from Secodecon. Please go ahead. Thank you, Joey. <clears throat> Good morning to all of you. Good morning to all of you in a city where we are talking about people and in my uh, 24 hour stay in the city, I didn't see people. I traveled 25 kilometers from the place where I stay to this venue, and I don't see people, I don't see workers, I don't see people, common people, I don't see common people settlements. I mean, earlier, I thought it was impossible to imagine a city without people, without common tenements, but uh, I think these cities have made it possible. So congratulations in a sort to all of you. Also, thanks for coming to this COP. I think this COP is important and very close to the, to the realization that we are still at a precipice of three degree to four degrees Celsius rise in temperature by the end of the century. That IPCC won't tell you. But if you look at uh, scientific assessments which are non-political, so to say, and non-negotiated, we are still a uh, at a three to four degrees uh, Celsius rise by the end of the century. Latest Europe reports uh, tells us that if all countries fulfill all their promises, including their net zero commitments or pledges, so to say, till now, we will have a 2.4 degrees Celsius rise in the, in the temperature by the end of the century. But we, we know how good these countries are in fulfilling their promises. A very small example is the 2009 promise which G20 made to uh, phase out fossil fuel subsidies. And fossil fuel subsidies have risen. Many countries have raised their fossil fuel subsidies not by 2, two 3%, 5%, but by 48%, 50%, like that. And now, last year, in 2020, fossil fuel subsidies doubled in comparison to uh, 2020. 2021, they doubled in comparison to 2020. They say that because of the Russia-Ukraine war, we are facing a huge energy crisis. We are staring at a cold winter, and we need energy to, to, to uh, uh, protect our people. We need coal, even at the cost of getting coal, oil, gas. Isn't that what we have been saying for the last 30 years? that we need energy, we need development space for our people. So it seems that the, it's, it's gone a full circle. Negotiations have gone a full circle. And we are going round and round, and we don't have anything concrete in the hands. So I am sorry for this pessimistic message, but I think that is the truth. I have been asked to speak about the uh, food sovereignty and agriculture. I mean, food sovereignty is a sort of expletive to use at these places. Nobody talks about food sovereignty, and it's, it's quite impossible to think how we can ensure food sovereignty uh, by these kind of negotiations process. I'll, I'll explain a bit later also. Why I'm saying this, uh, 1.2 million people are experiencing food, moderate and severe food insecurity in the last year in the, by the latest FAO report on uh, state of food insecurity in the world, which they brought out in July. And 11% of the population faces severe food insecurity. And while the moderate food security remains almost at the same stage from the year 2020, uh, the severe food insecurity has raised, increased many times because of the impact of COVID and because of the impact of this uh, economic shock due to, due to war. And uh, pandemic alone, 
sent more than 150 million people in, in, in food insecurity. And this 1 million 50, 150 million people does not Im include the full impact of food insecurity because of the pandemic, because there is no consideration of the job lost in the pandemic in this 150 million that I'm saying. So if you look at it honestly, it will be several times, at least 5x people who are uh, facing food insecurity. And uh, one third women face anemia and there is no improvement since 2020, uh, 2012. Food security has, food insecurity has almost risen every year since we had this uh, Paris Agreement, except for break of one year in 2015. Uh, children, if you, if you compile the figure of stunting, wasting, and, and overweight children, 34% of the children are undernourished today. And even in 2030, even in 2030, we will have, in the best optimistic scenario, we will still have 670 million people in food insecurity. And this number is almost exactly the same as we had in 2015 when we negotiated this Paris Agreement. So, Despite all hulablu, all, all energy, all big talk of addressing food and uh, food security in agriculture, we see that there is no progress. Three basic reasons of this food insecurity, the state we are in, is because of the conflict. We are in, living in a world which has, last year has seen maximum conflict after the World War, Second World War. We have more than 700 live conflicts going on around in the world. It's not only Russia, Ukraine. Uh, the second reason, biggest reason is climate extremes and they have already talked about it. I can't talk much more about that, but I mean, because of just six days of heat waves in the early, early uh, summer this year, Wheat production in India was, India and Pakistan also, was reduced by one third because of the heat waves. In early February, when, early March, when it's almost a transition time from winter to, uh, winter to summer. We never had heat waves so early. Heat waves killed more than uh, 100 people in India and Pakistan. And it's not only Asia. In Africa, you have 2,700 people being killed because of the drought and famine in countries like Mozambique, in countries like Uganda, in countries like uh, Chad. You have more than 8 billion people affected due to, due to drought and famine in Ethiopia itself. And then you see the, the uh, floods in Africa, Nigeria, South Africa, many countries they have never imagined they will have this kind of floods. Uh, you look at Pakistan. Pakistan has 1% uh, contribution in carbon dioxide emission. More than 1,700 people dead, 30 million people affected, 40 billion US dollars damage. So who is responsible for that? In entire year, Pakistan emits as much carbon which U.S. does in 16 days. There has to be a responsibility. There has to be accountability. Unless we see that, it's not only about agriculture and food and energy and transport and housing. I mean, there must be some fundamental problems with the core of the system that we are in. I'll come to that later. I mean, if you... Agriculture has a lot of investment. The second region is inequity in investment I'll come to. Agriculture has a lot of investment while we have been uh, fighting for 100 billion of climate finance since 2009 in Copenhagen. Agriculture every year has almost 700 billions of investment. But most of it 
is in the developing countries, almost 550 billion in, in OECD countries alone. And 540, around 540 billions is direct support to rich farmers in the OECD, which sort of competes our farmers and our imports, exports from reaching these countries, usually distorts the market. So how do we address that? And these are the, these are the uh, solutions, I think, that, that we should think of if we are, I mean, uh, Ivan talked about corporate capture and corporate concentration. So the four big companies, Monsanto plus Bayer, plus Chem China and Syngenta, and BASF. If you add two more, uh, Cotiva and uh, Lima Grain, 70% of the agrochemicals and seeds are controlled by this. So what do you do? So unless we address these kind of concentration, it's, it's quite impossible to address. And not only, not only, yeah, not only these kind of investments, they corner also maximum of the investment that the government provides. Uh, last but biggest reason and the biggest threat on food security in agriculture is the land. And last week we had a land adaptation, uh, land gap report. And it says that the countries which have made commitment to reach net zero and address it through nature-based solutions will require 1.2 billion hectares of land to achieve net zero. And just to give you a small extent, uh, I mean, example, 1.2 billion hectares is equal to all cropland in the world and equal to the area of USA. So we are putting our hopes on these kind of false solutions. And very small example, I have just one minute. I hope I can get a grace of 30 seconds. Uh, by grace of organizers. Very small example, corporate concentration, we talked about Nestle, the biggest and worst agro company, agro business company, which has a emission of twice of its home, home country, which is Switzerland. Switzerland has an annual emission of 46 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent every year. Nestle has an emission of 72 million tons of carbon dioxide. And they are planning to address it through nature-based solutions. They will require 4.4 million hectares every year. Any, the Italian oil giant, will require 8 million hectares. Shell will require another 8 million hectares. So these three companies together only will require 20 million hectares of land which is equal to the cropland of Malaysia. And I can't go into, and I don't think, I think people know what are the impacts of these kind of nature-based solutions and where are people in these nature-based solutions. I will wind up by saying that, I mean, we can't address these questions about agriculture and food, about poverty, about trade, about housing, about energy by looking at it in the silos. And I think unless we address the imperialism, which is, which is a continued imperialism and climate imperialism, a lot of us now say, we don't have any way out of it. Why I'm saying that? I'll just take 10 seconds to point you a few fingers. US emitted 24.68% of the global carbon dioxide from 1850 to 2020. How much they will emit in a time scale of 1850 to 2030? 22.28%. So they are re reducing less than 2% of their emissions. EU 27, 17.0% to 15.16%. Uh, around 2% of their emissions they are reducing from 1815 to 2030. UK from 4.25% to 3.63%. And rest of the world, what they get from the colonial period, industrialized, industrialization period of 1850 to 2030, 
they emitted 23.0 percent during 1850 to 2020 and they will emit 24.33 percent from 1850 to 2030. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ajay. Um, hopefully, we will be able to discuss this a little bit further later during um, the open forum. So now I'll give the word to Carola Mejia from Latindad. She will be further developing on climate finance effectiveness. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much. Can you raise the volume a little bit? Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be part of this uh, multi-regional panel. And I will speak about uh, climate finance, but I want to bring to the table and to the discussion another big solution, false solution that is being discussed right now in these rooms, in this COP27, that are the carbon markets. Th that is uh, the mechanism that the UNFCCC is promoting as a solution. And we know, and I don't know if you agree with me, but capitalism and carbon uh, and markets uh, cause the, have caused the climate crisis, so we'll never be a solution for it. We have to be very aware of that. And under the narrative of the net zero, uh, of course, big polluters will choose to offset their emissions instead of really redu redu uh, reducing them. So it's not a solution, and it's not taking us any, anywhere. I also want to... Uh, raise a flag on the 100 billion pledge that has been committed in 2009 in Copenhagen. Uh, it was a very randomly figure chosen from the air uh, by politicians, by people that was there in the moment. But it, this, this 100 billion pledge was supposed to be delivered from developed countries to the south from 2020 annually. And we are in 2022 and it hasn't been fulfilled. Uh, can you believe there is no climate finance definition yet, agreed? There are many methodologies to measure this figure and a, very, a lot of different numbers and a big gap between them. Uh, and something that concerns me and Latindad a lot is that this uh, 100 billion, well, the, the money that is being delivered through a very difficult uh, financial architecture is coming to our countries in the form of loans, mostly. 71% are loans that increase our debts, and they are not uh, concessional loans many times, and uh, the majority are very expensive loans that have to be repaid by our countries that are already in a very, very difficult situation regarding debt. We are facing different crises. We are in a, in a really uh, difficult moment right now, and this is not helping us. This is really uh, creating more problems in our, in our economies. Another problem is that it's mostly uh, focused on mitigation. And there was a commitment made uh, in, in COP26 in Glasgow to double adaptation climate finance because that's what we need. The, I think, and I, this is a personal uh, opinion, I, I think climate finance should be mostly for adaptation and, for cost, of course, for loss and damages because we know the impacts are there. We, have, we are hearing and we, are, we know that these impacts are going to be more devastating every year. And we can see nothing is being done in the north that should be doing the effort right now in mitigation. So that's another thing that I, I think uh, it's important to focus. And also, the, this very complex financial architecture that has been created. There are a lot of climate funds that are very bureaucratic. It takes sometimes until five years for a project to be really approved. Can you imagine? We don't have time to, to tackle this crisis, and we have to feel very difficult forms. Uh, we are struggling with the language. Every uh, multi uh, multi uh, multilateral, bilateral, uh, uh, and the different uh, sources of climate finance have different uh, procedures and very bureaucratic procedures, and it's very difficult to really access. And this access is mostly done through uh, intermediaries or to the national governments. There, is very, there are very few examples of direct access for local communities, for young people, for commun uh, indigenous communities, for the local people. There is just 10% of the climate finance that is going directly to local stakeholders. And that is something that has to completely change, of course. Uh, and uh, after so many uh, years, I, I said uh, there's not a, a, an agreement on, on the concept, on the methodology, there's no transparency, and we are really relying on trust, on expectations of developed countries to deliver, and they are not doing that. They are promising this every year, and 
I, I, I haven't entered to these rooms. So they say they're disappointed of not doing it, but they are also struggling with the war. But we know there are, the, the money is there. We know, we, we know that this year, 600 billion went to fossil fuel subsidies. We know that one trillion dollars for the first time was uh, uh, spent in, in military uh, expenditures because of this war that it's so, it's, it's so absurd. And uh, for me, uh, climate finance uh, should not be about solidarity between the, the, the North and, and the South. It should be really about reparations, about recognizing this historical climate debt they have with the planet and the people. And of course, we have to put climate justice in the center of, their, of, of our demands. Uh, for that, I think it should be mostly public funds, not private. We know the private sector is not attracted if they don't have profit in their projects and adaptation projects and loss and damage. Uh, well, of course, won't uh, create any profit. So it has to be ground-based, public. Uh, it has to be also um, more as accessible. And, and a good thing that is happening right now in COP27 is, uh, is the process of discussing about a new goal of, of, of climate finance to be set in 2024 and to be uh, operative uh, from 2025 on. And we know now that we need trillions. We don't need the 100 billion annually. We really need trillions. We really need it fast. We really need uh, to include the climate justice uh, uh, argument in the middle. And of course, uh, for very important principles uh, that guide effective development cooperation. Those are country ownership. Uh, that means that there should not be conditionalities and uh, uh, the debt is also, is also something that should not be happening. This, this uh, is something very important that the government, uh, the people that are receiving this money can decide on what to do with that because we have our solutions in the ground. We are, and, and we are under a very uh, neo-colonial financial architecture and systems and that's something that we really need to criticize. They are using also always these uh, loans and loans and loans to, to expand this dependency on the North, and it's, it's not fair. It's not fair, and it's, it's time to, to raise our voices. It should also be focused on results for the people. Right now, these climate finance uh, mechanisms are asking to demonstrate the results, but we ha the people that is being affected have to develop a lot of research, uh, data, collect uh, everything, to show the impacts to, and it's very complicated, and sometimes they have to hire a person to do that, so it's not really responding to the needs. Sometimes the, uh, the, the, the funds or the, the donors tell the people what to do or what their solutions are. That's not the, the approach we want. We want climate finance that is fast, that responds to our needs, that is needs-based, that is gender and et ethic, uh, uh, that is done under the gender and ethic approach. We need the language, we need that, no technical uh, uh, language to be included there because we don't understand that. It's so complex when they offer some things and we have to uh, fulfill so many things and procedures. Uh, and of course, if it's co uh, about climate justice, it has to be respectful with human rights. We don't want projects that are going to be uh, funded with this money to harm there are many big scale or large scale projects of uh, renewables that are displacing people, that are creating problems and impact, and people that even have access to energy. That's something that we really need to see. Um, also, uh, it has to be under an inclusive partnership, uh, and it's important that stakeholders, and something good about this discussion about the new goal is that it opens that dialogue about quality, about access, about not creating more debt, about bringing the other stakes, uh, stakeholders to the table. And that's something I really hope that could happen in the next technical di di dialogues, to listen more to the local people, what are the needs, what, are, what should be the windows to deliver more fast, to deliver fast and deliver the amounts that are according to their needs, because some of these funds give millionaire, prog uh, millionaire funds <laughs> or resources, but the projects are super complex and very difficult to access, so it's not responding. And also it needs to be uh, uh, according to the principle of transparency and accountability. I'm saying there is no a a climate finance definition, no one methodology to track how much is being disbursed, how much our countries are receiving, and everybody has a different approach, and I think they are double counting. They are, this is not additional money to the ODA money they have committed in other instances, and it should be. And 
right now we are facing another uh, opportunity. In this COP27, we are talking about a new facility to finance uh, loss and damage, which has been a demand for the, of the Global South for many years that has been put back uh, by big uh, Global North countries. Right now it's there, and we have to fight for that facility to be a reality. Because we need money right now to, to, to tackle all these losses and damages that, that reach millions or billions of dollars that are right now being assumed by our governments that don't, that don't have a fiscal budget to do that, so they have to rely on more debt. And more debt implies less resources for health, education, uh, social protection, of course, climate action in our countries. So it's a very critical moment. I think big polluters need to pay for their debt. And I, I, I don't like the, the argument the, the global norm sometimes make. Yeah, we need uh, so many trillions and we have to bring the, the private sector and catalyze their investments. Because some of this private sector is really also a responsible, a big responsible of this crisis. The corporations that are making billions this year because of energy prices and uh, the, co the fossil fuels, co fossil fuel corp corporations should be paying something. If you tax them or if you, we find a mechanism that is not under this uh, financial architecture that is right now being operat operative that is failing, really need to think, to think outside the box and, and see another ways of bringing them, but not to invite them because they're, they're not going to come. Really they tax them on their carbon emissions. It tax them and control their emissions because they have to be also responsible. These negotiations don't talk about that, and it's important. And this is a, a matter of life or death. We are really reaching that point. The other day, somebody asked me if I had hope. I'm a very optimistic person, but I'm terrified. And I'm, I'm a mother, I'm really terrified, and I'm economists trying to uh, work and have a, some advocacy uh, work everywhere to raise this issue, because the IPCC shows that if we don't really limit our emissions until 2025, that's less than three years, we are not going to make it for the Paris Agreement to be fulfilled. And that will be late. And that will be a crisis that won't be uh, solved with vaccines, like, for example, that happened with the pandemic, with the COVID pandem pandemic. We are, not, we are going to cross a threshold where there is no point or return or it's going to be too late for humanity, and we are causing the problem. We really need these things to be uh, understood, and we really need to act and, and, and have the people uh, accountable of, of, of what, has be, what has been done. Uh, so, well, thank you. Thank you, Carola. I give now the word to Samba Fall from Enda Energy. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I just want to um, come back to one particular issue that are related to the global stock take and to elaborate more on the uh, local um, non-state actors that are really very um, useful for, for, for doing this kind of uh, process into the national um, uh, level. But I would like to start uh, reminding all everyone that at the moment, a recent report doing, done by the New Climate Institute have just reported that the potential of between 15 to 23 uh, ton gigaton uh, CO2 be between 2015 and 2030 uh, for the potential contribution coming, so coming from our non-state actors. But also the non-state actors also, we know that uh, from the grassroots level can contribute to uh, this global, global adaptation that uh, we are all talking about here in Sherman Sheikh. But we have to bear in mind at the moment that uh, the way that these climate processes, uh, likely the national communication, the biennial update report, are not really considering this local contribution of non-state actors. So this is the one fact finding that we have to bear in mind. The second one also is uh, regarding the, the developing uh, countries' perspective. The existing MRV system does not really 
consider these local contribution and it's not really well uh, integrated into at the national level. But also, um, we know that also um, when it comes to the reporting, uh, the mitigation side can be very easy because we have some methodologies. But we have to know that uh, ad for the adaptation side is still critical and that's where we have to focus because most of the non-state actors are doing, providing and initiating very good solution that are well matured. But uh, the issue is how to consider it into the global picture when it comes to the reporting. And that is not yet there. So um, in the uh, uh, non-state actors perspective also, we have a, a, a diversion and a variety of actors uh, uh, ranging from local, local grassroots CBOs, but also private sectors and also local authorities that are implementing at the community level, district level, um, uh, adaptation uh, when it comes to agriculture, um, uh, livestock uh, uh, sectors, some good solution, but it's not well monitored and accounted into the national perspective, uh, national processes. And also, uh, when we, we, we see the added value of providing rooms for the review processes, because uh, the national communication, but also the BUR provide room for national consultative process to review, to finalize and, and, and stabilize the global pictures when it comes to mitigation and adaptation. But uh, we do see in the developing countries that the national settings that are placed into, uh, that are into place now at the uh, national level are not providing rooms for these non-state actors. So it is not really well inclusive, if we, we might say it. But uh, we also recognize that, as one of my uh, colleagues have said uh, just in a moment, uh, there are a very good local uh, adaptation stuff uh, that are being uh, developed at, at the ground level. But the thing is that we have don't see the collaboration between the technology transfer um, uh, point of view with, within the, the, the national climate policies. So, and this is one thing that are hindering this local potential because we don't see the, these synergies between what is being done but also what are being reported to the UNFCC's focal point. And this led it to me that we have to now reverse or find out our way in a future in, at this, at, uh, from right now in the Chairman Sheikh. Because um, at the moment we have seen a very big talk about the, this technical dialogue. So to what extent we have to continue with this technical dialogue? Because uh, if it is only done by expert, we will lose, very, uh, we will lose a, a huge potential when it comes to to, to the co contribution from mitigation but also adaptation. So we have now to really to, to think about uh, how we can help our non-state actors to be at the front of what we, what we are calling the global stake, uh, stock. And from the 2023, so we have only one year uh, behind, uh, one year left now, we have to submit, we have to submit the, 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 this final finding of this global stock take. But uh, we do see that uh, the non-state actors are not really well captured in, at, the, at the moment in this uh, um, uh, talk, but also at the national level in term, when it comes to the reporting. And that's why in, uh, in, at ENDA level, we have uh, uh, initiated a kind of framework because as have mentioned by one of my a previous panelist, we have to identify and promote concrete action to help our non-state actors to be at the uh, corn, cornerstone of what we are, what we are doing on, in terms of global uh, stock take. And that's why at ENDA, we haven't to wait until uh, uh, Charmeshek, 
We have started last year uh, what we call a non-state actor uh, uh, accountability framework where we are piloting and identifying uh, this local solution. But with clear indicator that are well identified because what we want to see is to what extent the, these non-state actors are contributing to the national goal because the national goal has already set up uh, a mitigation target but also adaptation target throughout a range of sectors including um, agriculture, um, water resources, energy efficiency, energy sectors, but also waste, money, waste sectors. But what we are trying to do now is helping uh, local authorities, um, uh, uh, CBOs, but also private actors to have a kind of accounting, accounting that will help them to identify the current and also potential contribution to the national goal. This is one thing. And this, the second one also that we are doing within this framework is also to promote communication, collaboration with uh, what we call at the national level the, the national climate community, which are the technical um, committee that are uh, uh, reviewing all activities that are relating to the reporting of for the, under the UNFCCC. So what we are promoting is to advocate more on the, uh, and how to better consider this uh, accounting framework because we, from this accounting framework, we, we will be able, throughout the indicators that we have already identified, each single um, contribution that are coming from the how to reduce emission at uh, uh, for AFALU sectors, on um, um, waste management sectors, but also energy sectors to the national goal, but also to what extent the CBOs uh, which are developing um, uh, irrigation, um, uh, innovative irrigation um, technologies, but also um, uh, uh, livestock um, uh, technologies that are not uh, emitting GSG, but are, that are contributing to adaptation. To what extent these uh, climate solutions are contributing to the uh, uh, sectors that are, have been already identified in our NDCs? So we are promoting this kind of collaboration between local solution accounting within the National Climate Committee that, are, uh, that have the role to validate, to review every single um, uh, metrics, every single um, uh, 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 climate solution that have to be reported to the NDCs. And last but not least also is how to scale up because we do see the added value of this such kind of framework because this framework uh, has a, a significant potential to showcase the local solution and how this local solution are contributing to the national picture in terms of uh, climate, uh, in terms of mitigation and adaptation goal. So what we are trying to promote now is how to scale up because we are still at the piloting phase and we want to, for each single local authorities in Senegal to, to adopt and to, 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 uh, to develop and implement this framework in order to, to showcase the, so the, the contribution to the national goal. And last but not least is how to really promote South-South cooperation because it's key. Because it is something that we are developing in Senegal, but what we would like to is to, 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 to scale up into the, within the region to showcase uh, at the moment what are the local uh, solution can, de can help to contribute to national uh, goals uh, for the NDCs. So thank you very much. Now, with that said, I will now uh, end up here my speech. Thank you very much. We've heard a lot from the panelists and thank you very much for all of your inputs. I've been trying to structure a little bit of the feedback, but before doing a wrap-up, we would like to uh, call on a couple of reactors from the floor. So I would like to invite Lobsang Yangsto from International Tibet Network for 
a brief feedback <laughs> on the on what has been shared. Uh, Tashi Delek. Hi, everyone. Uh, Tashi Delek uh, means hello in my Tibetan language. Uh, so my react over here is that um, when we talk about uh, grassroots solution for the climate change and net zero, uh, I think of my, my country, uh, uh, Tibet. Tibet uh, makes up 2% uh, of Earth's landmass and it holds one-fifth of uh, global uh, soil carbon. Uh, and thus, Tibet's grasslands are very crucial for, to combat the greenhouse gases. However, at the COP27, we don't have any Tibetan to discuss on these issues. Tibetans, Tibetan people are not on the global climate dis discussion. The question is why? Because of the colonialism because of the Chinese occupation of Tibet. Not one single Tibetan from Tibet has ever attended uh, COP meetings and then raised their voices briefly and shared the issues of what is exactly happening in Tibet. Therefore, at the COP meeting, I feel that there should be a, a space for the stateless people, people who are still under occupation, they should also equally have a uh, say and they should also have a say to come on the table and then talk about the climate change and how they can also contribute in terms of climate change and mitigation and adaptation measures. I, uh, IPCC listed colonialism not only as a driver of climate change, but also ongoing issue and which exacerbate the communities vulnerable to it. The second issue that I want to raise over here is the uh, inclusion of communities and indigenous people in the, uh, uh, in the whole climate change mitigation and adaptation issues. With the case of Tibet, as I said earlier, Tibet's grasslands helps the global world to combat the green, uh, grass, uh, greenhouse gases. However, two million Tibetans have been forcefully removed by the government from their grassland because they blame the Tibetan nomads for the cost of grassland degradation and then their way of living as very barbaric and uncivilized. Tibetan nomads has been living on their land for more than 8,000 years. Their local tradition knowledge and their knowledge of environment protection has been the solution for the grassland degradation, not the cost of grassland degradation on the Tibetan plateau. Therefore, I also insist here that Tibetan people should be in the part of uh, local uh, in the global climate uh, discussions and also in the policy makings. And it is very important to adopt right-based approach which legally protects frontline communities and respect their traditional knowledge. And uh, then uh, thirdly, I would also like to raise about Tibet being called the third pole because it holds the third largest ice mass outside the North and the South Pole. Tibet is also known as Asia's water tower, where all the major rivers flow from Tibet to 10 of its downstream countries. More than 1.4 billion Asian populations are dependent on the water that flows from Tibet. The Asia's major rivers like Brahmaputra, Mekong River, Salvan, Indus, Satlaj, all of these rivers flow from Tibet to the downstream countries. 
But when we talk about uh, these issues, downstream countries have remained silent. When we talk about climate change, I wonder how can people choose which are the issues that they feel more comfortable to talk and which are the, how do they decide that they want to remain, remain silent on some other issues? And we always talk about climate justice. I think that, you know, everyone should be brave enough and to talk about these issues and countries should come up and raise the issues. Because at the end, we are all interdependent. We are all interconnected. His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, we have only one blue planet. So therefore, I think that uh, it's very important to have uh, and improve access and transparency in the scientific research on the whole Tibet's glacier and how it impacts on the downstream countries and also have a collaboration and cooperation with the Tibetan experts in our scientific work. So I finally feel that uh, uh, it's a very privilege for me to, uh, to get this space and talk because I am in exile right now. And uh, on behalf of uh, all the Tibetans who are back in Tibet and um, Tibetan people, the environment defenders uh, who are still in jail. Excuse me. Uh, sometimes uh, we feel that uh, we are not part of this whole discussion. People uh, remain silent and uh, they decide which issues to talk about, but I feel that uh, we Tibetans are still fighting for the whole occupation and the brutal rule, and Tibetans inside Tibet will continue to protect our environment, and we will continue to uh, protect the environment and the grassland and that not only benefits the Tibetans, but also benefits the whole Asian community for uh, food and water security. Uh, I would like to thank over, uh, and over here, and uh, I would like to thank everyone for your attention, and thank you for the uh, space provided to me. Thank you. Cantuta Conde from Red de Jóvenes Indígenas de Latinoamérica y el Caribe. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, hi, my name is Cantuta. I am a member of the network of indigenous youth from Latin America and the Caribbean and focal point of the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. First of all, I want to thank all the panelists and thank you for sharing all of your experiences, but not only just raising the problems in your community, but also sharing those recommendations that you have given us, because you show that we don't only, in these spaces, we don't only show our problems, but also our actions. So thank you so much for sharing those insightful actions that you have in your communities. Hearing all of you and hearing from all of your knowledge, I really feel like I have connected at least in one bit with your experience that you have shown. First of all, when we talk about women and the importance of traditional knowledge, me as an indigenous youth, I know that all my elders, my young girls, or any woman in the community is directly a knowledge holder. And this, I must say, this is such a specific and very insightful, something that you very much respect. Because women are the holders of that knowledge. And there are knowledge that only women hold. So that's why when we talk about women and their relationship to climate change, to combating climate change, it is essential to have them on the tables, as many of the panelists have said. Particularly for young girls, we always believe that 
for us to continue this intergenerational knowledge, we have to carry on this knowledge, this great responsibility to be the next guardians of that knowledge and also the guardians of our identity and our people. When we talk about different actions that you have shown, and I think that the important part was that we don't only have like assessments, scientific assessments, but also actions and stories, like testimonies of women in leadership. I really like that part because it shows that people, when we talk about data and how many people are suffering, somehow they are not really connected to it. But when we share stories from our people and their experiences, that is very different because we feel a very close connection to it. And also I very much appreciate all of the projects that you have been given, particularly with the GS, with the global stock take, because I was also part of the table during the global stock take. And of course, states and other members have all the time they have to give their statements, but us who are not part of the dialogue are only given a few minutes. So somehow that you have been preparing for the global stock take really shows that you have all of these actions in the table. And just finally, I really want to like to highlight that word when we say we don't want solidarity, we want responsibility. Because it's true, when we're talking about fund, funding, we know about the colonization history, particularly for Latin America and other parts of the world. We know that these funds, these countries came to our, our, our people extracting all of our resources, and now they come here and they tell us, we will give you some funding to stop the extractions we keep doing today. So how can we continue this? We have to stop, it's not about we asking as peoples for their solidarity, but it's for respect and, for, and to stop this continued colonization and to actually stop to nature-based solutions be a new form of colonization. I thank you all for your actions. I would really like to make a summary of all of your points, but I'm only taking out the highlights. Thank you so much for sharing all the experience. And I would just only like to finish that. I know that we all come from different spaces, from different experiences, but I think that we're all heading towards the same goal we're all holding hands in the same road, and I hope that we get that together and to fight for our future, for our children, and for our people. Thank you. I am almost out of words, so, <laughs> and I don't, I think we have a lot of time, but I would like to give the space for some comments from the floor, just uh, to bear in mind that uh, we don't have a lot of time. So if you can keep your interventions small. I'm wondering if we have a microphone? Yeah, awesome. Uh, Jax will be facilitating that. Uh, so we have two um, colleagues here that want to intervene. Um. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, thank you and congratulate you for bringing um, different participants around, from around the world. Uh, if we see the panel, uh, it is very well represented. I think we should continue uh, this kind of collaboration and cooperation and raise the voice of our people. We are not part of the solution. We are the solution. And I would like to explain myself. We have the level of the sustainability, not the level of the profitability. If we talk about profitabilities, we are part of the solution. But if we talk about sustainabilities, we are the solution. And we, we have to think about that. The other things I would like to add is related to the solution. I think uh, Samba have raised uh, the issues of the gap related to the, uh, the reporting in the global stock take. Of course, uh, if we rely just on what the government is doing, we will not meet the Paris Agreement. But if we say that, yes, 
the non-stake actors have contribution to do in terms of how much of hectares that was reclaimed around the world when we are talking about land degradation, it is part of contribution. And these need to be taken into account. So please, uh, let's also share more solutions. Yes, we know the, the problems are there, but let's raise the solution, and then I think that people will take, uh, take us more seriously in this process. Thank you again very much for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, uh, you presenters. You really brought a very interesting contribution in this, uh, in this context. So thank you very much. Uh, following my colleague, uh, Emmanuel, I would like to raise some two or three questions to the, to, to the panel. Um, I'm from ENDA, and uh, I'm also the, uh, chairing the National Climate Committee of Senegal. Uh, I would, uh, as you know, uh, the reference document uh, in the countries is the NDC in terms of climate change. So uh, there is uh, inside this document an engagement of the people, of the state, of everyone to the international community. So we have to work to achieve uh, the goal that have been defined in this document. So I want to know uh, from the panel to what extent your country uh, have uh, contributed, have considered putting people and real solutions at the heart of climate action in terms of contribution in this NDC? That is my first question. The second one um, uh, is related to people that are on the ground. As you know, uh, uh, on, on the ground, you, you have uh, communities, uh, local authorities, and uh, uh, local administration that are working and uh, uh, doing actions that contribute to the combat the, uh, the adverse effect of climate change and specifically to um, work to achieve the goals that have been defined in the national uh, uh, determined contribution, the NDC. Uh, uh, Sometimes these contributions are not um, registered in the system. And what, uh, what, what is your proposal in terms of uh, uh, making this link uh, that is happening on the ground and it is not registered on the, uh, at the national level? What, uh, what solutions do you propose? Because it is related to people on the ground and that are not uh, really uh, registered at the national level. The last question is related to LDCs. You know, the LDC is a new, uh, is a new um, topic of uh, discussion in the climate change. Six years before, six months before, it, it wasn't. Uh, and as the NDC is going to the end, in, in, in two years we will be uh, reporting to the international community. And uh, uh, do you um, think that uh, uh, for the next, uh, t next term of the NDCs, uh, uh, it will be easy uh, regarding what is going on in terms of discussion. Nothing is happening. Uh, the contribution, the, the discussion are contradictory. Uh, do you think that uh, there will be a room to take into account the, L, the uh, loss and damage inside the next NDC? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'll just, any more questions or comments? So I think we'll just go back to the, to the panelists and see if they can address the questions that have been raised. Yeah, Ajay, go ahead. Thank you so much for the questions. And uh, that gives all of us an opportunity to add what we could not add in the beginning. So let's be very clear about the fact that the carbon budget now is only 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide. And even entire of this budget is given to the LDCs and middle-income countries. They won't be able to develop to the extent of the countries, industrialized countries, which, which they, have, they have achieved. Because now with renewable energy, we don't have that density in the energy to support development. So the entire talk that we are seeing is, I believe, unfortunately, a sham. So 
I mean, countries are trying to put people in the center, developing countries, low-income countries, to the extent that they can. But they don't have policy space. They don't have fiscal space. 60% of the LMICs are under debt distress. And they are paying more on debt than health or education. So in those circumstances, how do you expect poorer countries and governments to put people in the center? They can do only as much as they can do. So in, in response to your second question, that a lot of talk is happening, a lot of pledges is main, being made, but that does not get uh, translated into concrete action. Two very recent example. Last year, non-state actors, 1,500 regions and cities uh, committed, pledged that they will become carbon neutral. This year, UN Secretary General brought a report. They say that the commitments and the pledges made in that is not even worth the paper they are written on. They are nothing more than fairy tales. So there must be and not only this was out of the COP, even in the COP, developed countries pledged 356 million to adaptation fund. 176 million has not been uh, realized even in agreements and 50 million uh, US dollars, despite being signed, has not been delivered. So there must be a mechanism to increase accountability of the countries of what they say and it's, it's not, jo not just everybody having to say whatever they want to say they feel happy with and get away with that third question uh, ajay sorry for timekeeping purposes and to give the floor to other seconds. panelists 50 seconds 50 seconds loss and damage we have been going round and round in circles assessments technical assessments uh, capacity building, I mean, there is, there is, if you don't have money, you can't address loss and damage. And the talk has just, we are happy that it has been taken on the agenda, but the fight remains and I don't see ho any hope of LDCs uh, incorporating certain commitments from uh, on loss and damage in the next LDC round, which has to happen very soon in 2025. Thank you. Thank you. Before giving the word to Samba, I think that uh, Makoma wanted to speak, but we have like no time, so you need to be very like, concise. <laughs> Thank you for the um, for the for the comment. I would just respond to one of what our countries are doing. Um, I would say that South Africa um, is a country full of possibilities, but also there's a lot of contradictions. We just have adopted, the country has just adopted um, a just transition framework, which is basically a policy for the country moving towards a low carbon development. And, and in that um, framework, um, just transition framework, it's based on the principles of justice, the principles of uh, procedural, um, distributive and restorative justice and in that way it says that uh, the justice issues, the climate justice issues also are part of uh, the framework of moving beyond and uh, this one thing around this framework that we're saying that we don't want to leave anyone behind so there's continuous engagement, there's continuous consultations with different stakeholders um, at different places and so that we can be able together to move towards a low carbon development. Lastly, there's a comrade here who had said that uh, the NDCs are actually an acronym for nationally determined catastrophe because he says most of them don't have content, they don't show intention, it's just something that is written, just a glossy a presentation to say this is what we're going to do, but never, and he says he doesn't think that that would be implemented at all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'll just give yes. 45 um, seconds each. <laughs> yeah, quickly, I just wanted to add on the NDC side from South Africa as well, that um, the government is trying its best. The latest NDC that we have is better than the first one. They have tried to include, you know, community, communities, consult, 
although not to the satisfactory of civil society. It is through our pressure that they were able to consult with youth, with local communities, and there is a reference in the NDCs of uh, women concerns of youth and local communities. However, uh, we need more action. We feel the indices could have been done better, but there are small pockets of improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Yes. Carola. Uh, very fast uh, for your first question. I've been following NDC process in Latin America, and unfortunately, they are not participative. M some countries have some mechanisms, but most of them are not. Uh, especially under the updating process, uh, it was even worse, of course, of the pandemic and everything. Uh, it is uh, important to have mechanisms to include the people in the table to, to discuss this, these issues and these policies uh, instruments. And I totally agree that, uh, to your second question, that there should be like a mechanism to add all the local efforts to the national goal. That, that, that should be happening, but it's very difficult because it's not only technical, but it's also about political will and political coordina uh, coordination between levels. So, so it's very important to work on it. I think the global stake Stake talk, uh, uh, the global stakeholder gives us like the same uh, uh, challenge, but at the global level. So yeah, it's going to be like that. So um, I will be short. I think that uh, this question raised uh, the, the the big issue uh, about uh, the dialogue, and I think that uh, that should be the way forward, because we shouldn't have a top-down approach where we develop our NDC and after we are promoting developing communication, but I think that it should be the way around. We have to start it developing, identifying solution from the grassroots level and after uh, develop our, revise our NDC based on the finding. And the last one would be how to develop an MRV that are having rooms for accounting this local solution. And I think that we have started in Senegal, we have started piloting this MRV system for the grassroots level. So wh what we have now to find out, rooms for political buy-in of this initiative and, and help our national uh, NDC process to take into the, this consideration, this initiative that can help them in a, in a future. So these are my two uh, points uh, to, to, to share. Developing dialogue, but also having this opportunity to have a more inclusive MRV system. Thank you. I won't be able to do any wrapping up. So thank you very much for coming. And we hope we can keep on working together to promote these sort of spaces and conversations. Thank you very much.